Blog Talk Radio. We are the UR Tennis Network. Our mission is to be the voice of tennis. We enlist a team of passionate enthusiasts to promote our sport. We strive to bring interesting perspectives on the many spins of tennis. Our goal is to provide the learners of our sport with current news and information from many angles. We seek active participation from communities interested in tennis, but tennis is not interested in them. We are expanding our outreach. Tennis is a true lifetime sport that needs to be talked about, and the UR Tennis Network pledges to pursue this idea relentlessly. Good morning and welcome to the Parenting Aces radio show on Blog Talk Radio's UR Tennis Network. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and we have another fantastic show for you this week. Last week, we were scheduled to have Tracy Austin on the show. Unfortunately, she came down with laryngitis and couldn't join us, but guess what? She's all better today and is going to be with us sharing her experiences both as a player and now as a tennis parent. And, oh, my gosh, does she have a lot of experience to talk about. I'm so excited to have her on. I want to just give you a little bit of background on Tracy before I bring her on the air. She is a two-time U.S. Open champion. She won Wimbledon mixed doubles, and she's the former number one in the world on the women's tour. She represented the United States on both the Fed Cup and the Whiteman Cup teams and was on the winning team both times. She played Chris Evert. She played Martina Navratilova. She was in an incredible um, era of women's tennis players and uh, just had an incredible career. A little personal story, I first met Tracy when she was 14 and I was 14 and she was playing in the girls 14s nationals in my hometown of Shreveport, Louisiana. I was a ball girl at the event and loved just hanging out at the courts. And I got to see her play Pam Shriver at the National 14s, which is unbelievable. So now Tracy's all grown up. She acts as a commentator uh, for the Tennis Channel. She writes for Tennis Magazine. She is uh, doing coaching workshops on the Tennis Channel. And in between that, she's raising a family. She has... Uh, three sons, uh, one who's 18, one who's 16, and one who's 13. And we recently re-met at Winter Nationals, and that's how I roped her into being on the show. And I'm just I'm thrilled to have her here today. So I am going to bring her on the air. In the meantime, I'm going to play a short commercial, and when we come back, Tracy Austin. Warning. Orthopedic surgeons are seeing an increase in overuse injuries when young athletes perform the same repetitive, repetitive, repetitive stressful motions over and over, over. Pitching, tennis, weight training, even long swimming workouts can cause overuse trauma that may require surgery. If your kids play and train hard, visit orthoinfo.org or stopsportsinjuries.org. A message from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine. Welcome back to the Parenting Aces radio show on Blog Talk Radio's UR Tennis Network. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and I am just so excited to have with us today Tracy Austin. Let me just make sure Tracy's on the line. Tracy, are you with us? I am. Hi, Lisa. Hi, thank you so much for doing this today, and I'm so glad your voice is is stronger this week, and uh, hopefully we won't wear you down too much. No worries, no worries. So I I gave a little bit of background on your playing history, but didn't really talk too much about your parenting history, so we'll jump into that a little later in the show. But I wanted to start out just talking with you and asking you maybe to share with my listeners a little bit about growing up in Southern California as a tennis player, growing up in a family of tennis players, and what that was like back in the the 70s and 80s when we were coming up. Well, my mom was uh, had five children, and she started playing tennis after her fourth child and was just absolutely passionate about it. 
and played at a local public park with Vic Braden. And when Vic Braden decided to start a tennis club with Jack Kramer, they asked my mom to be the pro shop manager. And so we all moved, uh, or she moved tennis courts from the public courts to the Jack Kramer Tennis Club. And uh, I was born a couple weeks after the courts were poured there. And she, because she worked six days a week, all five of us were there just about every day, all day. And it was just a big part of our life. I'm the fifth of the five. So uh, everybody else was playing. I was dragged along to all the tournaments that they were playing, that my older brothers and sisters were playing. And so tennis was always a part of my life. And found out at a very early age that I was passionate about it and, and loved to just hit the ball, whether it was playing with someone else or hitting against the backboard. And so getting dragged around to, to all your brothers and sisters' practices and tournament matches, et cetera, what impact do you think that had on you? I mean, do you think you came out with this love of the sport or you think that was something that you didn't have a choice in or somewhere in between? I think I had a... a Loved it from the beginning because there's pictures of me playing tennis when I was three or four years old. Just loved hitting the ball. And, you know, there's a, a, a picture that, um, you know, unfortunately Vic Braden just passed away, and there was a, a picture in, in the magazine, and it's him holding me, and I'm literally two or three years old. I've got the biggest smile on my face. And I think it was important. Vic made it fun right from the beginning. I mean, we all knew who's his uh, great personality. Um, I think I enjoyed that. And going and watching my my brother played college tennis at UCLA. I remember sitting there in the stands and you know running around half the time, but also being a part of that type of atmosphere where there was so much noise, it was loud. You know, he was playing on the same team at UCLA with Jimmy Connors, and they'd play against USC and Stanford. I remember my brother Jeff playing at uh, Pacific Southwest, playing against Pancho Gonzalez. So all of that, instead of, um, yes, I played hide-and-seek and, and did those kinds of things at the tournaments when I was very young and, and a part of that, but I also I think it also had a positive impact because I love being part of that world. Do you feel like you were just kind of thrust into it, or were did you feel like growing up that it was a choice and that if you had said to your parents, hey, I'm done with this, that they would have been okay with that? You know, it's interesting. Um, we, you know, I'm one of five, as you said, and, and as I said, um, and all five of us, um, yeah, four of us became professional, but my brother Doug liked tennis, but he didn't love it. So he went on to play college tennis, but it wasn't something that he was as passionate about. So he didn't play as many days a week. My mom kind of encouraged us to play, and we, but we were allowed to take it to our level. But when you're talking about my love of the game and whether I was pushed, um, you know, there was just really nobody was going to get in my way. I loved the game from the beginning. And I don't think anybody gets to the top in the game without having a tremendous passion because at the end of the day, you're the one that has to spend that extra hour and you're the one that has to, um, you know, have that desire to, to push yourself to get better, to practice your serve, to do all of that. So, as I mentioned before, I loved it from the beginning. I feel actually very fortunate that I just happened to be plopped in a situation like that, and I was able to find my, my passion very early. I think there are a lot of people that go through life and it takes a while for them to find something that they're passionate about, and others who maybe never even find something that they really are, you know, love that much. So I feel that I was very fortunate to kind of have that type of a situation in Southern California with Vic as my first coach, who was fun, Robert Landsdorp, who came to our club when I was seven. And if I had started with Robert, I maybe wouldn't have continued playing the game because he's such a <laughs> such a taskmaster. Um, so that was the right order as far as coaches came along. Um, and then at the time, because Robert was such a great coach, he had so many. He coached so many great national um, champions as well. I had plenty of competition, so it was kind of a perfect storm. Sure. So can you share with us some of the juniors that you came up with and maybe some of the college players, you know, that were at that next level ahead of you as a young junior that inspired you? Yeah, I came up with uh, Anna Maria Fernandez and Anna Lucia Fernandez who went on to play at USC. Um, and you know, I always practiced with those two girls every every week, and they were two years older than I was. Also a girl named Trey Lewis who went on to play um, professional tennis. She was three years older than I was. So there were uh, plenty of girls, but I practiced with a lot of boys as well. I mean, at the time at our club, my older brother John was there, Elliot Telscher was there. I mean, just looking back, there were, you know, 30 or 40 kids that were going to the Nationals. So it was kind of that type of an atmosphere where everybody was working hard 
everybody was setting goals and everybody was trying to improve. And uh, that was just tremendous to be around. And also, remember, you're practicing with girls that you're going to be playing on Saturday and Sunday. So you always kind of have your eye on, on your court, but eye on the next court as well. And I think that's a, it's a great motivator. Sure, and there's a lot of talk about that with player development now with USTA and bringing kids together to train together to compete against one another and to push one another to that next level. It sounds like that just kind of happened organically for you. It did. It absolutely did. It was just because Robert was such a great coach and uh, you know, coached coach these kids and had a lot of motivated kids at the same time. And I do think that it's important. I see a lot of juniors today, and they don't really like to play against each other. They don't like to compete in practice, and they're, they're actually going to you know, shy away from it. And I think that the kids need to, to play more sets. They need to compete against each other. And it's also important to play against players that are better than you, worse than you, so that you used to do winning matches, closing matches out, and players that you're a fierce competitor with and you don't want to lose to. So it's, it's great to have that variety. Sure. Well, you turned pro at a very young age and had incredible success at a very young age. Can you talk a little bit about how that was for you? I mean, from a social perspective, from a family perspective, how it impacted your family life and, you know, what things you love from that and maybe some things that weren't so great about it. Yeah, you know, it was a very interesting time because I was really the first young one to kind of to kind of come out, and it happened accidentally. I played in a tournament in Portland. Uh, my older brother Jeff, again, he was playing in the men's division there, and it was raining in Southern California, and uh, we don't have any indoor courts here. So he said, "Come on up and play this indoor women's tennis tournament, and you'll get a few matches. You'll spend some time with me." So I went up there, spent some time with him. It was in pre-qualifying, got through the qualifying. <laughs> got into the tournament, and it happened to be a Futures and uh, kept winning. And at one point in the middle of the tournament, I actually went back to school, flew back to, to L.A., went to school for a couple of days, went back, played Mary Carrillo in the quarterfinals, Stacey Margolin in the finals, won the tournament. So that was the start of my tennis career, very different from what we see today, where everything is very planned. And, uh, you know, you start at a certain level, and, and uh, every, again, everything is planned. I kind of enjoyed that it was that way. Um, but I literally played on the tour for a year and a half as an amateur, and I got to the quarterfinals of the U.S. Open as a 14-year-old, lost to Chris Everett, and went back the next summer as a 15-year-old and played 16 and 18 nationals and beat Pam Shriver in the finals of both of those. So that was a lot of pressure. Um, you know, it, it's funny because then I got to the U.S. Open quarterfinals again as a 15-year-old after I'd won the, U- the 18 nationals twice in a row, and I was still an amateur, and uh, friends of mine from New York that I always stayed with, Dick Zausner, he sat me down and he says, now what's the issue here? Why are you refusing to turn pro? You're, not, you're top ten in the world, and you're still an amateur. And I was just nervous to have my life change, but he finally convinced me uh, to turn pro when I was a couple of months from 16, and uh, you know it worked out well. So if anything, I was very slow and uh, dragging my feet about turning pro, but it worked out. Do you think that a 14-year-old girl today could follow that same path? And, I mean, you know, the name that comes to mind off off the top is Cece Bellis. I mean, we saw her yeah. have a great win at the U.S. Open this past summer. And, you know, watching her kind of make her way through the professional events now, but also continuing to play some junior events every now and then. Right. I think it will be more difficult because of the physicality of the game. You know, the players are a lot taller, a lot stronger. I think it takes a while for both boys and girls to break in now. Um, Also, because of the age eligibility rule, the players aren't able to get as much experience as quickly uh, because of the limited schedule from 14 to 18 when it finally becomes unlimited. Um, You know, it's uh, it's very difficult. And the, the tour is so deep with so many players from so many different countries when you look back, there weren't players from Serbia 15, 20 years ago. You know, these, they weren't players from some of these smaller countries. So it's much more difficult to break into the top 100. Sure, sure. So how was your mom through all this? Was she... Well, my mom. <laughs> well, I mean, was she the stereotypical tennis parent or, 
you know, what are some things she did really well? And then what are some things that looking back you think, oh, my God, I can't believe she did that? Yeah, the only thing I can't believe she did is how great she was. I mean, really, to have five kids playing, I mean, I have one that's playing at a national level. And, uh, you know, it's 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 a lot. It's very time-consuming. It's, um, it's very exciting as well. Um, but my mom was always very calm and very supportive and very positive. And, excuse me, one second. <coughs> a little cough there. But, uh, you know, looking back at, the way that she dealt with all five of us, and again, all five such different personalities. We took it to um, different levels. Um, you know, as I said, my brother Doug not interested in as much, and she was fine with that. She really was a magical tennis mom, and she never got mad. The only thing, and I've written about this in Tennis Magazine because I have a, a kind of three or four times a year I write an article about uh, parenting and juniors. Uh, is the only thing ever that I had to tell her is, you know, right after a loss, I don't want to hear, you know, I should have done this or I should have done that. That's the only thing really over the years that I had to remind her. Other than that, she was uh, the, really the best, one of the best tennis moms I know, and she just had an even demeanor and very positive at all times. That's incredible. I mean, what, what really a testament to knowing, her. Knowing now what we go through, right, Lisa? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I I mentioned before I brought you on that, you know, I recently saw you at Winter Nationals. And, I mean, as much as all of us parents love being there and watching our kids, because let's face it, we do. We all love seeing our kids perform at that level. It's incredible. But there is an underlying stress and pressure that we feel and that we're constantly dealing with trying to hide from our kids so that we don't <laughs> pass it on to them. And, I mean, it's it's very tough. And so to hear that someone like your mom, who is the parent of these incredibly accomplished players, was able to master that is pretty inspiring. You know, it really is. And, again, because uh, – I think it was helpful for me to, when I start started to have, going down this path with Brandon, who's 16 now, um, you know, I definitely made some mistakes in the beginning. And it was very helpful to have a role model like my mom who, again, balanced. I always use that word balance. She just was always so even-keeled and, and level-headed and uh, took her time when making decisions and, you know, rarely raised her voice Um so she was just a great model, role model to have, you know, when I started down this path, and it's it's definitely been an interesting path. It's uh, it's uh, a, a lot. It's almost like another job because you have to know with which tournaments your kids should play, and you know, you're traveling. My husband travels so much in the summer with Brandon because I'm doing television. Um, so it's an interesting dynamic for the rest of the family as well because you know our other two children, we have an older boy and an old and a younger son as well. You know, sometimes they feel a little ripped off that Dad's gone so many weeks in the summer. Do they have activities that they're involved in at the same level as Brandon's tennis, or are they more quote normal teenagers at this uh, stage of the game? They're more normal teenagers. I mean, there are very few kids in the country, you know, Lisa, that are involved like our kids. I mean, you know, our kids, it's it's they, it's it's a it's a everyday affair you know they're they're constantly working with their coaches they're constantly working with trainers and this is all brandon's um desire and i really kind of took a page out of my mom's book with our three children our three sons our oldest son dylan played on the high school tennis team but he's not very competitive i mean he doesn't you know he likes to win but it's not that important to him and uh he really enjoys tennis enjoys the social aspect of it but it's a really terrific player he actually is at USC right now, and he's, he's part of the team, not playing on the, on the playing squad, but part of the team. Um, and our youngest son, Sean, plays basketball and baseball. They actually all played all the sports, but at 10 years old, Brandon came to us, and he said, you know what? He came into the office crying. He said, what's wrong? He says, you know, he was the first pick at, on the baseball, whatever it's called, the um, I forgot what it's called, but he was the first pick, and he said, you know, I don't want to play baseball anymore. He says, you know, I, I just want to play tennis. But all the other sports are taken away from my sport. So we knew that he really had a love for tennis. Oh, <laughs> I mean, that's a tough call to make at age 10. Yeah, and it was his call because my husband was the was the coach, and, <laughs> you know, it was uh, – 
it was a it was a big deal for for a kid like that. And then our youngest one, Sean, is still playing basketball, and he played baseball all the way till last year, and he's playing tennis, and and he tried the cross as well last year. So it's uh, each one of our my kids as well is as I said is is taking it to a different level. Well, I, and that's awesome. I mean, from I have three kids as well, and only one plays tennis, and and thankfully it's my youngest because I don't know how y'all do it with the you know well you you just have one other one at home still, but um, you know I watch families that have multiple kids and multiple activities, and I I just don't know how they figure out the logistics. It's incredibly challenging. Well, and also the expense of it. It was interesting because I talked to a, a mother of a top junior yesterday, and really top junior, and we were just talking about the expense of it all and, you know, trainers and the coaches and the, every time you're traveling to a national tournament, you're on planes and airports, uh, excuse me, and hotels and rent a cars. And I said, you know, I don't know. I could take a guess at what we spend each year. And she said, I do know. I was an accounting major. And she said, I use a different credit card, so I know exactly to the penny of what we spent. And she said they spent $36,000 on her daughter's tennis last year. So it's also very expensive. Right. And that's probably a relatively conservative amount of money, honestly. Do you think so? Um, I do. Um, I, I hear from other families that – spend two and even three times that a year on on their child's wow. tennis um and more so i you know and you that's one of coaches well I, it's not even that i think it really depends on the part of the country you're in and i was having this conversation with someone yesterday who couldn't believe how far we have to drive for sectional events and right. because we're in the southern section and it's nine states, you know, you could be driving 10 hours to a tournament. And wow. it's just insane. You know, in Southern California, Yule's tournament structure is, is a bit different. Um, Florida has a different structure. Texas has a different structure. So, uh, you know, really, like you said before, it was a perfect storm for you coming up in Southern California. And I think for kids who stumble upon tennis who didn't who weren't born into tennis families and they stumble upon the sport and they happen to be situated in a tennis rich area like Florida or like uh Southern California it you know you you kind of are in a a little bubble of of what junior tennis can be and it it can be very different for people outside of those bubble areas and and extremely right. expensive. I think in many ways as well because of practice. I mean, practice is so huge. And, right. um, you know, my son Brandon, within a half an hour, has probably 20 play- players that are his level to play with, whereas I would think as you get into the more rural countryside states, whatever you want to call it, especially for the boys, and they get so strong at 16, 17, it's tougher to find good competition. For sure. And even uh, it's interesting because <laughs> I've actually gotten emails from families in Northern California saying we can't find competition for our child, you know, and so right. we're considering moving. And you think, oh, but you're in California, you know, but no, it, it different parts of the country are very different in terms of strength and availability of coaches and competition and tournaments and all of that. So right. that interesting. Interesting. The interesting line that you just said is we are considering moving. It's amazing how many families have actually moved for their children's tennis. And it's just a, it's an interesting dynamic, you know, because uh, you, you think about all the ramifications for the other kids that are dragged along because of that one child's tennis. I'm not negative on it. It's just an interesting dynamic that you're talking about. It's it's very interesting. And I, I've talked to several families that have done that, too, and it, it it's not something I can get my head around. I just can't imagine ever doing that mainly because of my husband's line of work he's a lawyer so to pick up and move would be incredibly difficult but um yeah, but I, we know of plenty of families that have actually done it where the mom moves with the child and then the father yes. stays home with some of the other children so that's not unusual right I, and yeah you're right and what does that do long term to a family though that's you know be interesting to track that um and and what happens if the child decides they really don't want to do this tennis thing anymore. Right, right. You know, that's, well, that's a big that, load. Look at, the percent, look at the percentages that actually, quote, make it. And, you know, what is success? I don't, you know, I think for every family, success is different. Um, 
I will be 100% honest with you. If Brandon came today and said he wanted to stop, I would be completely fine with that, only because I know it's been a wonderful journey. He's learned so many things. He's learned discipline, sportsmanship, um, you know, good character, uh, you know, work ethic, so many things. So it's really it's in his hands. But I know that there are so many families that wouldn't feel the same way. They felt like they've invested so much, you can't quit. And I just wonder if the son or the daughter feels that, number one. And number two is, what is success? I think every family has a different feeling about that, what that is. And I think there are way too many families, in my opinion, that feel success is top 100 in the world. And it's top 100 in the world or bust. And I think that's, you know, that's tough to make. I mean, we know how many yeah. millions of kids are playing tennis and what the percentage of kids that are playing are going to be top 100 in the world is less than 1%. So I think sometimes people forget along the way that they need to look at the percentages. Yeah, I agree with you, and, I, and that's an excellent point. And I, it's refreshing to hear that you would be okay if your son said, you know what, time to move on to something else. I've, you know, I'm done with this. It's been a great run, but you know, see ya. <laughs> and I, that's I, because I, it's been his choice. I think. I think if a parent feels like it's been their choice and they've been pushing from behind, then they're going to feel let down. And I think, um, you know, again, at the end of the day, we all want a happy and healthy healthy relationship with our kid. And I, it's funny, I remember one story really hit me. It was about five or six years ago, and I was doing an event in Michigan. Actually, I was going to the, um, <coughs> excuse me, the Midland Mission, Midland, Michigan event. The What is mm-hmm. that, a Futures or a Challengers? I don't, I don't know what it is, for the women. And uh, the guy driving me there was talking about his wrestling career as a youngster and talking about his dad pushing him and how they just ruined their relationship and today at 35 he still did not have a good relationship because of that you know i think of all the parents the tennis parents i think that's one thing that they need to remember that there's a long life after tennis and that you want to have a good relationship with your son or daughter so this is this is a sport but your family should really should come first for sure let me ask you a question Uh, have you considered or are you currently homeschooling brandon brandon does not go to homeschool he, he okay. will not go to homeschool. Okay. And I'm not against it for others if they have if they you know if they think that's best and they think maybe the schooling's better or it works out for their family. But uh, I mean, just a little story. I won the U.S. Open at 16, and I went back to school. And um, I mean, I, I did not play the Australian Open and the French Open when I was number one in the world because I was still in regular high school. So. My husband, Scott, and I really talk about the fact that we always kind of go back to the center. When we try to make a decision, we seem to take the safest route and go back to the center. Um, you know, don't want to get too far outside the box. And, you know, Brandon has never brought up that he wanted to be homeschooled. He seems to enjoy going to school and having friends, having somewhat of a normal life. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because he is a junior now, and you, know, you start to follow college tennis a lot more closely. You know, I follow the scores and he starts seeing boys and girls that I've seen at tournaments for six years now, and you start to pay attention, and there's most of them, no, I shouldn't say most of them, there's a number of them when you look at the college rosters that have been homeschooled, or what high school did they come from, so many. So when you don't go to homeschool, and you're playing against kids that aren't going to school, have so much more time on court, it, it is more difficult, but for us, it works out this way. It's interesting. I actually just interviewed a young man who's a college freshman this year playing for his team. He also uh, stayed in regular public high school through his high school years, and he was telling me that he feels like he's at such an advantage now in college with his teammates who were homeschooled that he's actually the one teaching them about time management and um, using the tools that that the university provides to them, you know, and and really knowing how to take advantage of all of that, and so he's kind of become the mentor for right. a lot of his teammates who were homeschooled, who don't have those skills coming into college, and uh, I, I, you know, I agree with you. There there seems to be an alarming number of children who are opting for virtual school or home school over traditional school just because they want to be on the tennis court more. And I question the value of that, you know, and, and long-term, what is that, how, how is that going to impact them? 
Yeah, you know, I I don't want to judge others. I mean, I just know that what we we've chosen to do, and um, you know, at the end of the day, I want Brandon to be balanced, healthy, healthy, happy child. And you know, if he, you know, hopefully he will play college tennis. He's you know he's one of the top recruits in the country as a junior. So, um, you know, we're going through that process now, which is that's interesting. That's a whole new learning curve as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it, it really it you've just gone through it. Yes. And, uh, exciting for your son Morgan. He's going to be starting soon, right? Uh, in the fall, yeah, he'll be at Santa Clara yeah. next fall. So yeah, yeah very we're very exciting. excited. Yeah. So you know, so I don't want to judge, but it just it's it's changed, and it seems like the bar has been raised where parents and children feel like they can't get enough tennis in, enough workout time for workouts, whatever, unless they do the homeschooling. And you know, I think where it comes into play, and this I'll be honest with you, Lisa, is the traveling. You know, I mean, there's plenty mm-hmm. of time for Brandon to to practice and to to, to get his workouts in. But what he is hindered in is that he's not able to travel to as many tournaments. You know, there's a tournament, a team tournament in Mobile, Alabama coming up in a couple of weeks. It's a level one, which is a huge national tournament. And right. But he can't miss a week of school and then turn around and miss another week for the spring championships and then for Easter Bowl and, you know, without his grades dropping. And it's very important for him to keep his grades up. And so, therefore, he does miss some tournaments that the homeschooled kids are able to travel to. Interesting. And, and yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, it's funny because I think USTA has tried to look at reducing the days of school missed, and, and they really tried to create a competition schedule that accommodated the kids that were in regular traditional school. But I, I just don't know that that's possible. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, you know, it's such a large country, and, uh, you know, so many diverse kids, and so I think they're they're working their best. It's it's hard to make make a perfect schedule for everybody, and they tweak it a little bit each year. Um, you know, the one thing that I was really against last year was when they made Kalamazoo a 128 draw instead of 196. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. you know, I talked to a few people at the USTA about that, and it was not about my child. I would do this in 10 years as well. To me, if there's a kid that's been playing since the time he or she was six years old, and let, let's face it, Lisa. I mean, there's 1% of the kids that are playing Kalamazoo, or maybe 2 for, I don't know, whatever percent, a very small percentage are going to go on and play pro turn- tournaments. And so most of those kids at that point are there to try to be in front of the college coaches that all come to Kalamazoo and watch those kids play. And so I was really saddened when they went down to the 128 draw because I think that those kids have played for so many years, it's very important for them to be there and to be part of that, that college system for because that's another one of my pet peeves is nothing against foreigners, but our kids, our kids' chances in college are lessened by the, so many teams that are just stacked full of foreigners. And I would love, mm-hmm. this would be one of my, my biggest things in tennis, would be, yes, we want foreigners, we want that strong competition, but limit it to two foreigners for each college team. Oh, my gosh, you and I need to sit down and strategize here because <laughs> we are so on the same page with that. Very much so, yeah. yeah. And it I mean, is, it's tough. State schools. I mean, when you look at a state school where I'm paying taxes for these state schools, and then you know, I'm not going to name out any individual schools, but you see four or five foreigners at those schools that then come take the scholarships, get the great education at these UC schools, University of California schools, and then they go back to their country. And you have so many kids that have played so much tennis for so many years that have been taking that opportunity away as Americans. Mhm. Yeah, it's tough. It's a really tough challenge, and um, it's something I've that written one about. Seem like and that's so tough to me. That one doesn't seem that it just. I don't know why. What's the 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 drawback? And I can understand from coaches' point of view. A lot of them try to grab the Americans, but I understand they they need to win to keep their jobs. That's what I've heard. But if right. you made it fair, even a level playing ground for everybody, you have two. I have two. Well then, I think that seems it seems like that would be a changeable rule to me. I, I'm I'm with you. <laughs> I'm with yeah. you. We will yep. talk. <laughs> we will yep. definitely talk. Um, so I I want to just back up a little bit and ask you if you can compare what it was like coming up as a junior in terms of the amount of hours you spent on the court, the amount of hours you spent 
off the court with tennis-related activities, whether it was in the gym or mental toughness training or whatever it was you did, with what you're seeing now uh, with Brandon and, and his cronies out there? Yeah, I never played more than three hours. I mean, two, three hours, three hours, but it was hard. It was intense. It was focused. It was engaged. Um started doing some off-court things when I was about 15. Before, I did not do that, and I was a tiny little peanut. I mean, I was playing at the U.S. Open. I was 89 pounds, 4 foot 11. So <laughs> I uh, wasn't exactly lifting weights, you know. But um, I think kids today, too many of them tend to overtrain. That's just my opinion. I mean, Brandon, with his schedule, never. he plays Most days he plays two hours, and some days he'll play three hours, but certainly never more. And I see that there are a number of kids that are playing four or five hours, chronic injuries, um, and a lot of times when you're playing that much tennis, you're not fully engaged. So for me, I would really rather see intense, hard practice, you know, quality, not quantity. And when you start to play four or five hours, your tennis, your footwork's not going to be good. You're going to start to, to build up bad habits, in my opinion. So I think some of these kids overdo it. And, you know, in terms of getting in the gym, I mean, obviously you said you weren't doing that until you were older. Um, but we do see a lot of the kids, you know, doing off-court gym workouts, um, oh, track workouts. I agree workout. with that, 100 percent. I mean, at, at 10, 10 years old, when I was um, working with USTA at the Home Depot Center here in Carson, at 10 they were in the gym. And it's not necessarily heavy weight weights, but it's lifting and it's getting stronger and it's medicine ball and you know, different modalities to become more athletic, number one. Um, and number two, just to become stronger, to work on their core, to try to reduce injuries, to work on their um, – flexibility, all of those things. So I'm definitely in favor of that, and I'd say every other day for these kids. But, again, it's not to overdo it. Mm-hmm. And have you ever had to deal with injury with your son, and and has he been out for any extended period of time with injury, and how, how have you all dealt with that? Um, knock wood. I don't, not extended. I mean, of course, he's had his share of injuries. Um, you know, since he started working with a trainer about a, a year ago, uh, three days a week, uh, they have it decreased in a big way. Um, excuse me again. So I think, uh, you know, it's, it's again, it's um, finding that right balance of getting stronger and putting more emphasis on the physicality and the physical part of the game and realizing that that's just as important as keeping your body healthy and strong is just as important as how many balls you hit. Um, and, and, of course, it's paying attention, paying attention to your body and, pay, and listening as coaches, as parents, when something hurts, not just you know, shoving kids back out on the court. What do you think about all of the emphasis on the mental side of the game that's happening now? I mean, we have tons of articles and books being written about sports psychology and mindfulness and meditation and and all of that. Um, are you do you find that that's useful information? Is it something that was around when you were coming up? I mean, I don't remember anything about the mindfulness side of tennis coming up, but uh, but I never played at the level that you did. So I'm just wondering yeah, I think if... during my time we had Tim Galloway. He was talking about some things. I, don't, I mean, I don't remember what he was talking about. But the inner game of tennis, yeah. The inner game of tennis, yeah. But it's funny because, <clears throat> excuse me, I found at an early age when my mom would drive me to a tournament, I was very quiet, and in my mind I started visualizing what I needed to do when I was playing against my, my next opponent. And nobody ever told me what to do. Nobody ever told me to do that. It was kind of just something naturally that I did. Obviously, now we know that that's what kids are told, you know, kind of be in a quiet place, visualize how you're hitting your forehand, how you're moving, how you're being aggressive, how you're, you know, hugging the baseline, how you're serving, all of these things. The more that you can feel it, the more that you can see it, the better you're going to play. I've actually never even mentioned that to Brandon, not even one iota. Um, You know, he's my son is very calm on the court so um you know it, it, we have an interesting relationship as far as tennis wise he won't listen to anything that i say so <laughs> therefore i'm just mom and uh, you know sometimes that drives me crazy because i know that i have a few things that i could add that would actually help him but um you know those ears are blocked for now so um he hasn't had any of that mental training but i do think it's really imperative and helpful for for most kids, you know, not not to go overboard, but um, just to give them a, a little crutch because we all know 
that that's such an important asset in tennis. Definitely, definitely. Well, so I have to ask you because something you just said resonated with me that he doesn't listen to you. But obviously, you do have this incredible body of knowledge that you've acquired really? through direct That's experience. I wouldn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> do you do you ever like sneak an email to his coach or a text message and say, "Hey, would you mind talking to him about A, B, and C?" Because I think of that course. would really help him. Of course. So I will yeah. talk to his coach. You know this this um, you know this need could be worked on, or you know let's take a look at this. But um, you know I was at Winter Nationals, Lisa. I hadn't been to a tournament with him in a long time because my husband always takes him, and he really likes Scott to go better because I I don't know if he feels more pressure when I'm there. Or, or what, and so it was kind of fun to, to really watch him play some of those matches, and um, so, you know, again, it's just everybody, every family's got to find what works best for them, and right. I think what's most important is I've got to realize that I'm kind of a different parent than another, another tennis mom, you know, and so whatever makes Brandon, takes pressure off of him, makes him feel most comfortable is what's most important. I think I'm really looking forward to college because hopefully there's a whole team and I'll be able to go to every single match and, you know, cheer on the whole team. And uh, that's why I like he plays high school tennis. And the uh, last two years actually has been wonderful when Dylan and Brandon, my two oldest, were able to play on the same team. And it's, it was just one of the best experiences in my whole life is to see my two sons play on the same team like that. That's so cool. Did it ever come up that you were going to coach him? No. Was that ever no, a consideration? No. Never. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. No. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I don't think that's, for me, it just wouldn't have been healthy. Um, it just, you know, I'm mom, and I just don't think that uh, um, that would have worked for us. Interesting, interesting. And so now that your kids are getting older and, you know, you've got one in college already and and one heading in that direction and, and you know, your third one, I guess, is is he in high school already or he He's will be? He's great, thank goodness. Okay. Thank goodness. He's okay. got a few more years. Yeah. I, what do you see coming down the pike for you in terms of your involvement in the sport? We're seeing so many former champions getting into the coaching arena at the professional level. Is that something you would consider doing? Well, I, again, I have a seventh grader still, so I travel enough as it is with a television. And, uh, you know, and I know that I do because, uh, you know, Sean, our, our youngest, told me at the end of last year, he said, Mom, you're leaving again, you know, and that just, you know, that was a dagger in my heart when I went to yeah. to a to, to go announce a match. And so, you know, I really want to keep track of my schedule and really make sure that I'm spending enough to time at home, which I think I already do. I don't think he ever wants me to leave. That's the thing. Um, but, you know, for, for now I'm really content with doing t- tennis, uh, or excuse me, television commentary for Tennis Channel, um, playing at a few of the Grand Slams at the senior doubles. Um, I feel like I've got my hands full with, you know, with these three kids. You say when you go to college, you know, Dylan's at USC, you know, they're kind of gone. Well, they're still not gone. You're still juggling right. and, and doing a few things for them as well. So I feel like I've got a, a full platter. I do think, you know, I, when Sean is in college and um, it might be fun to, to coach someone young and to be able to import some, some of the knowledge that I have and some of the experiences that I have. You know, if, it's, if it was the right person, somebody really motivated, um, you know, someone with uh, talent and, and really uh, teachable, because I, you know, I worked at the USTA with, for three years, and there were so many kids that were not interested in, in listening, and there were others that were wide open, you know, couldn't get enough information, and those are the ones that were really enjoyable to work with. Talk a little bit about your time at USTA, because I think, you know, for a lot of us, um, Morgan's never trained at a USTA facility, so all I know about it is secondhand information. And I think it would be really interesting to hear from the coach's perspective, what you were looking for and trying to accomplish with the kids that came through. Yeah, well, I wasn't a big-time coach. I was a part-time coach because of my you know, my own children. So right. for me, it was more about the kids that I worked with that day. I, I worked with all of them, boys, girls. I was just there to kind of, um, you know, work with all of them. For me, it was all about finding weaknesses, about giving them ideas. Some of them it was sitting down and mentally 
talking to them if they were struggling because of what I've been through. They kind of were all ears and listening. And, you know, some of them were would call on me and say, Tracy, what do I do in this situation? Or about scheduling, um, some ideas about that, injuries, questions. I was kind of more uh, a mentor. and uh, But yet at the same time, I changed a lot of grips. I changed a lot of strokes. Um, hopefully gave them a lot of good idea on strategies and, and things like that. So I, I really, really enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, that was uh, fun working with so many kids. If they're there, they're obviously very motivated. Mm-hmm. But you said, you know, there were some kids who were – more alert, their eyes were wider, they were asking more questions, and uh, obviously, you know, I, I would think as a coach, you're drawn more to, to that type of child who really is interested in what you have to offer them. Absolutely. And, yeah, so, I, you know, from a parent's side, have you ever considered sending Brandon away to an academy to train and have that type of experience, or do you feel like he's getting everything he could possibly need at home? Yeah, for now, he has he's getting all the practice he has he, he could have at home. Um, luckily, we have a young boy, Connor Hans, who's one of the top kids in the country, mm-hmm. that lives five minutes away from us. And uh, they've just started a, a mini tiny academy, which is five minutes away from our house as well. So some kids that live a half an hour drive actually to that uh, to the, those courts. So right now, our son is getting plenty of practice. He's in public school. He's very happy. He's got his his you know workout uh, partner in the gym three three days a week. So for right now, it's ter- tremendous. And he's a year and a half away from college, so I don't see that happening for him ever to go to uh, a tennis academy. And I think that might just break my heart if I were to ever to send him away. <laughs> so I don't think I could handle Aww. that. <laughs> Oh, I I totally get it. I totally get it. All right, so you are this incredibly experienced tennis personality. It's beyond being a player. You are a personality in our sport. You have experienced life as a tennis player, life as a tennis coach, life as a tennis commentator, life as a tennis parent now. What advice putting all those hats on together, what advice would you share with those of us who are struggling through this journey, trying to make sure we make, you know, the quote, right decisions for our child and, um, you know, trying to avoid the pitfalls? Yeah. Guide Boy, us. That's a great question, Lisa. Yeah. Um, um, I think I want to go back first to the reason why they're playing tennis. And just I would love to urge parents to remind themselves as to why Johnny or Susie is playing tennis. Is it because they want to play tennis or is it because the parents want them to? And that to me is the most important component in the whole situation is that you want to make sure that it's the love of the child, that that's what they want to do, it's it's that, their passion. And if it's not, that to me gets very dangerous. And I think you would agree with me that we see plenty of kids out there that I'm not sure that that's really their passion, but it's the, it's the adult decision that's been made. So that's number one. And then number two is I would love to encourage parents to make sure, I'm not saying that I know it all, but again, I'm just working on percentages here, that how many actually make it. And there's so many that have left aside education, uh, you know, left aside kids, other kids at home, families being broken up because of this. Just make sure that they're trying to find the balance and, and you know, making making good choices. And I think, um, you know, I've, I've just heard of an, another family breaking up yesterday from, from situations. And, and it's just so those are things that are hard to hear when, um, you know, it's, again, it's, it's a sport. And, yes, there are Maria Sharapovas and there's Grigor Dimitrovs and there's Rafa Nadals, but those are so few and far between. So we got to remember that it's a, a lifetime and we're building a, a whole child. Absolutely. If you were at one of these tournaments and somebody jumped out at you as, oh my gosh, that that kid has it, whatever it means, what is it that you would see? Like, Do you think it would be something in the way they struck the ball? Do you think it would be something in their physical nature? I, because I think so many of us... Well, I, don't you feel like most parents think their kid has it? 
Like, wow. I I don't know. I guess you know what? That's a good point. I I maybe they do, and maybe I guess because I come from the point where I know what it takes. You know that I can look and I can see that most don't have it, and I'm just being honest <laughs> with you because I know yep. when you are. Rafael Nadal, and you are at the top of the game, or let's go down to number 10. Okay, Rafael Nadal, let's say let's take him. You're checking all the boxes. You're checking great footwork, speed, um, you know, mental toughness, great weapons, you know, be able, ability to, to uh, control your emotions under pressure, uh, you know, be able, smart strategically, ex, you know, go on and on and on. You check all the boxes. You go down to number 20. You're checking most of the boxes, but there might be a, a weakness or two. You get down to 100, there's going to be a few more weaknesses. You see my point. Mm-hmm. Well, the point is is that they're very – that's what I'm looking for in a junior. And you know, you're, you're looking for the mental toughness. Do they have that? Now, if they get upset once in a while, but they're able to get it back together, they're not going to be perfect at that age. There are some that have come along. You know, Martina uh, Hingis, I think of Monica Seles. Um, you know, I think that that was my best asset. I didn't have a huge serve, but mental toughness was my best asset. I'm looking for speed. I'm looking for athleticism. I mean, in this game, you need to be an amazing athlete to get to the top of the game now. Um, you know, I'm looking for weapons. It's not just about consistency. Consistency can get you to the top in the juniors, but consistency alone, that'll stop when you start to get into college and, and definitely into the pros. You need some weapons, to ways, ways to finish points off with. Interesting. And I, you know, I think of somebody like uh, David Ferrer, who, you know, he's not a big guy. You look at him and you think, well, there's no way that guy's going to make it compared to these, you know, six foot plus beasts on the court these days. Yet he's been able to stay at the top of the game because he has a lot of those boxes checked, right? Well, and but, a lot of those boxes are extraordinary. And those extraordinary boxes are his quickness. So because he's five foot ten, shorter than most of the others, he's that much quicker so he can make up for the distance. If he were not extraordinarily quick, that would be a game changer. And he's so mentally tough. He's a beast. And so mm-hmm. that, that makes up for some of those deficits as well. So if uh, that's, that's really what's important. It's really the complete package that you're looking for. You know, and and all, all of those assets, what do they add up to? Interesting. And, and so – have you had parents come up to you and say, my kid's going to be a professional player? And oh, and how do you respond to that? Oh, I've had kids that have lost in, you know, the quarters of a regional event. And, and regionals are great, wonderful, but quarters of a regional and asking um, Brandon's coach, you know, do you think my son can turn pro next year? And, he, <laughs> you know, he just lost in the quarters of a regional, and they're thinking that within a year they're going to turn pro. So, mm-hmm. yes, there are plenty of parents out there that um, – that are a little delusional, and mm-hmm. um, you know that there's there's plenty of that, and then you get the, the great parents. It's like anything in life; it's life is like a box of chocolates. Well, the junior junior tour is like a box of chocolates; you get it all. Yeah, for sure. I, yeah. I'm just curious. So, if if Brandon came to you and told you, I, I'm I'm going to go on the pro circuit. This is what I want to do. Because I mean, let's face it. Well, no, no, no. Maybe go to college for a year or two and try it out. And let's say he has incredible success at the college level, which there's right. no reason he shouldn't. Um, and says, "Okay, mom, I'm I'm ready to to try." What do you say to him? Well, obviously, it depends on the results. I mean, every decision has to be based on facts. So Brandon has has to be pretty much winning every oh, match come in on. The state of college. <laughs> No, 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 no. He has to be winning every single match in college to leave college. Um, in you know, in my opinion, I mean, there has to be a pretty good, a pretty good standard, high level there in order to for me to even think about leaving college. So actually, I think that's one of the toughest questions for kids for in in tennis. I should say in the whole sport of tennis is those players that are in the gray area. We all know that most ninety nine percent that play college tennis know that they need to complete the four years they don't have the skill level to turn pro early there's that one percent or maybe a half a percent that are good enough that maybe can turn pro right away or after one year and then there's those other kids there's a few very few a handful every year that are kind of in that gray area with whether should i go and stay another year or what should i turn pro that's probably the biggest decision for in tennis or the most difficult decision i should say in tennis Interesting. And so I know um, one of the 
female players at UCLA this year was struggling with that decision and uh, was having some success on the Pro Tour. And, you know, it was a big question whether or not she was going to come back and play at UCLA this year. Which way did year. she go? I, I know who you're talking about, but I, which way did she go? I don't know. I, I, my understanding is she's playing at UCLA this spring. and. Okay. Um, and I think her coaches are very excited about that fact. Yeah, exactly. Great to have a player of that level, right? Stay. Right, right. Um, but it was interesting to me. I I had the conversation with one of the UCLA coaches um, during the U.S. Open about her. And, you know, it was interesting to hear the reasons that – were swaying the decision one way and then the other way. And and I do think you're right. That's such a an incredible situation to be faced with as a player. So what and were the, what I, were the reasons that swayed the decision? Do you know? Well, I don't know what, or... what swayed the final decision, but, I mean, I, I know she was getting pushed um, by the governing body to, to go ahead and try her hand on the Pro Tour and ah. – um, you know, she was winning some matches, and so, you know, they were encouraging her to keep keep going, keep trying, keep trying. And, uh, I, you know, I, I think it's tough right now because I think our governing body is, you know, so hungry for that next champion that sometimes, you know, that gets so in the way about of... We're kids, a few kids that are in that position, though. Right, right, yeah. very few. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so it's it's easy to look past the individual, I would think, um, you know, and focus on what's going to be good overall for tennis in this country. And so, I, you know, I think the challenge for the parents then becomes making sure you're looking out for the interest of your child because oftentimes there are a lot of other people who really aren't looking at your individual child. They're looking at a bigger picture. Right. Right, I understand. Um, but you know, there's so many decisions that we all make in life about so many things. That, you know, we weigh the facts, and right hand, left hand, and we pros, cons, and and you know, we sometimes have to. It's it's difficult to make a decision because oftentimes it's not clear cut. Right. Well, even you know, and and you already saw this with your older son, but I suspect you'll see it in a different way with Brandon. That decision of where to play college tennis. Oh you know, my God. And yes. <laughs> I mean, it's got huge. A on that because as well, because you know, Brandon doesn't know where he wants to go, and that's. I understand that that's changed as well because you you can be recruited as a junior now, and so right. You know, Brandon has friends that are already have already given verbals to Illinois and Ohio State and Duke and you know all of these all of these schools that are juniors, and so from my understanding, Brandon and Scott are going to have to go make some college visits in the spring as a as a as a junior. So that's we're talking two months from now and go visit some of these colleges, um, whereas normally you would get your five official visits as a senior. But it seems to mm-hmm. have changed where most of these kids are already knowing by the time they start their senior year, the top kids at least, where they're going to go. Well, there's that. And then there are the top kids who are deciding, am I going to college at all? Yeah, and... there's a few of those. And I, we all know who yeah. those are as well. And right. the top and then, kids, the Taylor Fritzes, and, and on and on, and they're trying to decide, I have one more year, so am I going to get good enough in that one year that I shouldn't go to college, or should I just go pro? So there's a lot of decisions to be made at, at this time. Right. It'll be it'll be fun to check in with you as Brandon goes through the process and, you know, and kind of watch. We're process now, and you're trying to figure out, you know, and Brandon's decision-making, is it, does he want to go East Coast? Is it more about the school? Is it more about the team? Um, or is it most importantly about the coach? You, you know, this coach is going to be in charge of your child for four years. That's a very important part of the equation for me. Uh, right. As far as if the coach and, stays, <laughs> well, the coach stays. And the, the coach is yeah. his coaching ability and how he interacts with his, his kids, how he takes care of them, if he's paying attention, all of those things. So, as a parent, um, I'm very alert in the next two or three months as to, you know, colleges and where Brandon might want to go. Yeah. Well, it'll be fun for you guys. There's so many great programs right in Southern California that you can go and watch these matches and see the visiting teams and the visiting coaches and really get a feel for the different coaching styles. I for me that well, was really did that valuable. Last week I watched USC. A USC yeah. play. A, they had a team competition with four different teams. And one thing I will say, <laughs> I was disappointed to see the doubles reduced to a six-game pro set. I thought you know an eight-game pro set was already short enough. 
And the six-game pro set just went by in a flash. And I, I yeah. was disappointed. It's already no ad. And then when you get to two points, the other match is abandoned. And so it was all too short for me in the doubles. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. I was at I was actually at University of Georgia on Saturday watching uh UCLA play Georgia and uh it was my first experience under the new scoring format and yeah, I'm not a big fan, but um we are at the we end of our hour. A I lot can't of believe things, Lisa, you know. I'm sorry. I said we could just change a lot of things. Couldn't we? Well, <laughs> Lord help tennis if the two of us put our heads together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think we need to stay in touch. Um, I I so appreciate you being on the show, and I'm so glad you're feeling better and we're up for doing it today. And uh, I just I have so many more questions for you. I hope you'll come back again, and and we can delve deeper into some of these topics. I enjoyed it. Enjoyed meeting you out in Scottsdale, and good luck to Morgan. I know you're at a ex- very exciting time right now in your guys' life. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll keep we'll catch up. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, and and we'll keep an eye on Brandon, too. All right, take care. Okay, I enjoyed it. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. To my listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed today's show with Tracy Austin. She was uh, incredibly, incredibly uh, gracious in sharing her experiences with us. And uh, I, I will stay in touch with her and, and get her back on to to dig a little deeper into some of these topics and and it will be fun to follow her son as he goes through recruiting as well so uh anyway i hope you all have a great week and please share the show with your tennis friends and uh Stay tuned to ParentingAces.com for more new content. I'm working on articles as we speak. And for those of you who are planning to be at the Indian Wells Tournament next month, please shoot me an email or, or text me or message me and let me know so we can plan to hook up. I will be out there for a few days and would love to meet you face to face. So have a great week, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Parenting Aces, and I'll see you next week.